At six, UK interest rates hit their highest level since 2009, as the Bank of England hints there could be more increases ahead. The bank has raised interest rates to 1.25% as it tries to dampen down inflation. This hotelier worries it won't work. Hitting the business with higher rates of interest, which get passed on, you know, it just adds on to all the other costs. It's actually it's a perfect storm. It's a carnage. Inflation is now predicted to hit 11% this year, also on the programme. Huge queues to get seriously ill patients into hospital. England's ambulance service had a record number of 999 calls in May. Lifting the lid on the culture surrounding British gymnastics, a damning report brings to light the physical, emotional and sexual abuse suffered by young athletes. The Hollywood actor Kevin Spacey appears in court in London charged with sexual assault. And temperatures soar in England and Wales. It could hit 34 degrees tomorrow. Coming up on Sports Day on the BBC News Channel. The new Premier League fixtures are out. Champions Manchester City take on West Ham United to start the season. Good evening. The Bank of England has raised interest rates to their highest level for 13 years as it tries to dampen down the rapidly rising cost of living. They have risen from 1% to 1.25%, the fifth increase in a row as it tries to curb inflation. But inflation, the rate at which prices go up, is still on the rise. It is currently at a 40-year high of 9% and there are warnings that it could top 11% later this year. And if that wasn't difficult enough already, on top of all that, the latest figures show the economy is forecast to shrink by 0.3% in the current quarter. Here's our economics editor, Faisal Islam. On the outskirts of Doncaster, a hotel, a successful business, grappling with energy, food prices and wages, going up at the same time that household income is being squeezed and now a relentless run of interest rate rises too. We, we, we got a mortgage, you know, on, on the hotel, and the very day Bank of England put the rates up, we get an email going up. I fail to see how hitting the business with higher rates of interest, which get passed on, you know, it, it just adds on to all the other costs. It's actually it's a perfect storm, it's a carnage. It's almost like they're trying to temper a consumer boom but do you see much sign of a consumer boom? There's no consumer boom to temper. Outside the Bank of England, things seem bright, but inside, the bank's job is somewhat less sunny, to bring down rampant rises in prices, or at least stop them lasting for years rather than months. And that means making the cost of borrowing for households and businesses more expensive, slowing the economy. So today, the base rate, which is the foundation of costs of credit cards, loans and mortgages, was lifted again to a 13-year high of 1.25%. But as you can see from the chart, even at these post-financial crisis highs, it's still a rather low rate of interest by historic standards. And this is why rates are going up, because inflation already at a 40-year high of 9% isn't just heading for double digits. Now the bank thinks it could hit 11% in autumn as energy prices and sterling's fall push inflation yet higher. Of course, where it is very difficult is the balance between bringing inflation down and tipping the economy into recession. I think it's quite possible that we will see a period of contracting output. So off target is the rise in inflation that Governor Andrew Bailey has had to write a letter of explanation to the Chancellor. It's not just on this road in Peter Lee in County Durham where people are looking for explanations too. I would say that every single area is going to struggle. So even the more, the better off areas around the local villages, they're still going to struggle as much as everyone else is. It's not just a one category of person. And can you see people cutting back and spending less? I think they're going to have to. The evidence from here on the ground and increasingly across the economy raises a fundamental question about how many rises from Andrew Bailey or anyone at the Bank of England are now required. The crushing effect of the cost of living crisis is already slowing the economy down markedly. With the bank saying the economy is shrinking right now, the decisions over interest rates are fraught. The everyday decisions of households and businesses up and down the country 
even more so. Faisal Islam, BBC News. The number of people in England waiting to start routine hospital treatment has again risen to a record high. The latest figures also show the huge pressure the ambulance service is under. Our health editor, Hugh Pimp, is here to explain more. Hugh. Yes, Sophie, the latest snapshot from the NHS in England reveals a health system still under extreme pressure, with queues of ambulances like this waiting outside some hospitals. The number of people waiting for planned operations and procedures, like hip and knee replacements, has hit another record high, just under 6.5 million people. Although it has to be said the number waiting more than two years has come down a little bit. Then there's the percentage of patients assessed for treatment in A&E within four hours. In May, the figure was 73% within four hours in England, well down on May last year. Other UK nations, though, are not doing any better, though their figures come at slightly different times. And in May, average response times to emergency ambulance call-outs were around 40 minutes. The target is just 18 minutes. Some harrowing stories of long waits for ambulances are now emerging. Ken, who was 94 and in good health for his age, died after waiting more than five hours for an ambulance. He'd fallen in the night and the BBC has seen transcripts of his 999 calls. The words are spoken by actors. I need an ambulance because I'm going to fade away quite quickly. The ambulance service is just under a lot of pressure at the moment. We are doing our best. I shall very soon be needing a coffin, I think. Send somebody quick. An ambulance finally got to Ken's house, but he was unconscious and he died later that afternoon in hospital. South Western Ambulance Trust later offered sincere condolences to his family and said delays handing over patients to busy hospitals meant it was taking too long to get to other patients. Gloucestershire Hospitals Trust said health systems were under intense pressure with unrelenting demand. He was looking for the ambulance that never came. Ken's son, Jerry, told my colleague Jim Reid he wants to know whether he might have survived if paramedics had got there quicker. He was on his own and he knew he was on his own um, and, and he must have felt abandoned, you know, um, you know alone on his bedroom floor. Um, that, that, that's the most troubling part of it for me. It's emerged today that a patient died after waiting more than two hours in the back of an ambulance at one of England's busiest A&E departments, Leicester Royal Infirmary. The hospital said the patient unexpectedly went into cardiac arrest and their thoughts were with the family. Handover delays are of course part of a wider picture, reflecting the huge strain on hospitals and social care. The emergency department is full because the hospital's full. And the hospital's full because staff are not able to discharge patients who would otherwise be ready to either back to their own home or to um, social care or other community services because they in turn are full and there are, you know, we've seen real pressures in social care over the last few years that have meant that we've got less social care available than, than we had in the past. NHS England said thousands of patients were spending more time in hospital than needed. The Department of Health said extra funding had been allocated to ambulance services. But a health safety watchdog has called for an immediate strategic national response to address patient safety issues. Hugh Pym, BBC News. Lord Guite, the man who has resigned as the Prime Minister's ethics advisor, says he was put in an impossible and odious position shortly before he quit. In his resignation letter, Lord Guite made it clear that he had been on the verge of standing down over the Downing Street lockdown parties and the way the Prime Minister had dealt with the issue, but he says he finally resigned over a separate matter. He is the second ethics advisor to resign in two years. Our deputy political editor, Vicky Young, reports. He's walked out of his job, and today we got a partial explanation. Lord Guite had previously talked about his frustration being Boris Johnson's advisor on ethics. The final straw, though, was a disagreement over a trade issue. In his resignation letter to the Prime Minister, Lord Guite said he was asked to offer a view about the government's intention to consider measures which risk a deliberate and purposeful breach of the ministerial code. This request has placed me in an impossible and odious position, he said. He added that it would make a mockery of the rules on standards, saying the idea that a Prime Minister might to any degree be in the business of deliberately breaching his own code is an affront. I can have no part in this. 
This is likely to be a reference to ministers wanting to extend tariffs on steel imports, a move that could break international trade rules. This isn't the first time Boris Johnson has lost his adviser on standards. Sir Alex Allen, a friend of Lord Geitz, resigned from the same post 18 months ago. I just felt really uh, upset that Christopher Geit, who is a very honourable man, had been put in a position where he felt he had no option but to resign. I've known him for many years and he's a, a dedicated public servant, a man with lots of integrity and... Um, it's, I mean, he wouldn't have taken this decision lightly. It's, um, I mean, it's very sad that it's come to this. Lord Geit has been dragged into comments and rulings on Mr Johnson's personal behaviour, including the funding of a lavish flat refurbishment and Covid law-breaking in Downing Street. Ministers say this issue is different. I think it's very important to reaffirm that this appears to be a decision connected to a very specific uh, tasking that the Prime Minister asked Lord Guy to undertake in regard to support for British industry. That is not connected in any way to uh, a personal ethics issue. In his reply to Lord Geit, the Prime Minister defended his approach. My intention was to seek your advice on the national interest in protecting a crucial industry. I was looking to ensure that we acted properly with due regard to the ministerial code. To lose one advisor on ethics may be seen to be unfortunate, but to lose two shows that there is something really rotten at the heart of Downing Street. You know, we don't need a new ethics advisor. What we need is a new prime minister. Able to come out strongly, we now have Boris Johnson will soon need to find his third ethics advisor, someone willing to take on a role that's brought many challenges. So what happens next? Well, surely anyone willing to even consider this job will want assurances about the powers that they will have and about their independence. Now, Downing Street say that the whole role is actually being reviewed by the Prime Minister and he won't even start the search for a replacement until he's reflected on the best mechanism, the best way to make sure that someone can uphold ministerial standards, which means there could be months where Boris Johnson doesn't have an advice on ethics at all. Vicky Young, thank you. The Hollywood actor Kevin Spacey was mobbed by photographers in London today as he arrived at Westminster Magistrates Court. He's been charged with four counts of sexual assault and one of causing a person to engage in sexual activity without consent. Our correspondent Lucy Manning sent this report. Obstruction, please move. Kevin Spacey is used to the cameras, the attention but usually at film premieres on the red carpet meeting fans. This was altogether different, as the actor was jostled into court one at Westminster Magistrates Court, charged with five sexual offences. The court heard Mr Spacey had returned voluntarily from America to attend this first hearing. Standing in the dock, he gave his name as Kevin Spacey Fowler and confirmed his date of birth and London address. The charges he is facing were read out. He's accused during a period when he was artistic director of the Old Vic Theatre in London of four sexual assaults on three men and accused of causing a man to engage in sexual activity without consent. The Oscar winner is accused over an eight-year period from 2005 with the sexual assaults on men in London and Gloucestershire. The hearing today lasted just half an hour. Kevin Spacey has a way with words, but he said very little during this court appearance. He wasn't asked to plead guilty or not guilty, but his lawyer told the court he strenuously denies any or all criminality. The actor was allowed out on unconditional bail. The judge said he'd cooperated with four days of questioning in America and there wasn't a real risk he'd fail to return from the US. He must come to the UK in a month for another court appearance. His lawyer said the actor would establish his innocence. Lucy Manning, BBC News. Russia's Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov has told the BBC that Russia did not invade Ukraine and he repeated the Kremlin's line that there is no war, just a special military operation. Mr Lavrov, who's been at Vladimir Putin's side for almost two decades, criticised the UK for its policy towards Russia, telling our Russia editor Steve Rosenberg that it would be an understatement to say Russia's relations with the UK are bad. Hello, thank you. How are you? It was the first time Sergei Lavrov had agreed to meet since Moscow launched its offensive in Ukraine. 
Russia's government has created a parallel reality. Invasion? What invasion? We didn't invade Ukraine. We declared a special military operation because we had absolutely no other way of explaining to the West that dragging Ukraine into NATO was a criminal act. Russia's special operation has resulted in thousands of civilian deaths in Ukraine. Moscow claims it's protecting Russian speakers and fighting Nazis. I quoted a UN report about a Ukrainian village where Russian soldiers had forced hundreds of people, including 74 children, to spend a month in a basement with no toilet, no water. Ten people had died. Is that fighting Nazis? I asked. Unfortunately, it's a great pity, but international diplomats, including the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, the UN Secretary General and other UN representatives, are being put under pressure by the West, and very often they're being used to amplify fake news spread by the West. So you're saying that Russia's squeaky clean? No, Russia is not squeaky clean. Russia is what it is. And we are not ashamed of showing who we are. And what of the two British men sentenced to death by a Russian proxy court in rebel-held eastern Ukraine? Sean Pinner and Aidan Aslin had been fighting for Ukraine. I tell Mr Lavrov that in the eyes of the West, Russia is responsible for their fate. I am not interested in the eyes of the West at all. I'm only interested in international law. According to international law, mercenaries are not recognized as combatants. But they're not mercenaries. They served in the Ukrainian army. This should be decided by a court. And on UK-Russian relations, no expectation of an improvement. I don't think there's even any room for manoeuvre anymore, because both Boris Johnson and Liz Truss say openly that we should defeat Russia, we should force Russia to its knees. Go on then, do it. And that sounds more like a threat than an invitation. Steve Rosenberg, BBC News, St Petersburg. The time is almost 20 past six, our top story this evening. UK interest rates hit their highest level since 2009, as the Bank of England hints there could be more increases ahead. And coming up, we'll be live here in Surrey talking about the weather. Temperatures across the UK are heading up towards 30 degrees. In Spain, they've already hit 40. And coming up on the BBC News Channel, emotional and physical abuse was systemic in British gymnastics, according to a new independent review. The lid has been lifted on the world of British gymnastics and what's come to light is shocking. Allegations of physical, emotional and sexual abuse involving many gymnasts from Olympians to children at local gym clubs. The White Review has taken two years to complete. It heard from 400 people involved in the sport who have revealed a culture of fear in which the welfare of gymnasts was ignored in the pursuit of success. British Gymnastics has apologised to the athletes affected and praised the bravery of those who spoke up. Our sports correspondent, Natalie Perks, reports. For the last two years, British gymnasts have been telling us of a sport where they say mistreatment was the norm. I would absolutely describe it as a culture of abuse. Where weight was heavily controlled. How would you feel if you were 21 years old being given a, ultimately a baby plate to eat off of? And where hard training often meant ignoring painful injuries. I heard a click on my foot. I was told to carry on as if like nothing happened. I couldn't carry on. It was up to me to ring my dad to come pick me up and take me to the hospital where they told me I'd broke my foot in four places. Today, campaigners saw in black and white something they've known for a long time, that British gymnastics failed to put gymnasts' welfare at the heart of its culture. 
2012 Olympian Jennifer Pinches is one of 40 gymnasts currently suing the governing body. Um, it's just revealed the extent of the um, institutional betrayal of gymnasts in the UK um, and the amount of emotional, physical and sexual abuse that has been going on in the period covered. Um, so hopefully this now being on paper will lead to the change that needs to happen. The report lays bare a sport where, until now, the athlete's voice has been silent and there was a culture of fear. It said some athletes hid food in ceiling tiles or developed serious eating disorders because of a focus on weight, where the tyranny of scales was coach-led. And even though British gymnastics had the finances to do so, there was a collective failure to focus on well-being and welfare. The details in the review are at times horrific. It describes how one child was physically forced into splits till they thought their legs would snap, others who were strapped to the bars for hours as punishment, and some regularly deprived of water or access to a toilet. It wasn't good reading. Um, it was very difficult to read. Sport has been so important to me in all of my life. And, and to see that gymnasts had such poor experiences due to, and I will say it, the failings of our organisation, I was able to speak to some of the gymnasts this morning and to say sorry to them, and I wholeheartedly apologise. The report goes back to 2008. Before then, only three gymnastics medals had been won at the Olympics. In the last four games, though, with more than £38 million from UK sport alone, Britain has won 14, but at what cost? Do you accept now that sports have prioritised medals over welfare and have UK sport and Sport England been complicit in that? We do not accept the notion that um, there has been uh, a priority across the system for medals over other things. What I accept is that the experiences of the gymnasts that have come forward are harrowing and one case of abuse is one too many. Gymnasts are used to defying gravity. Defying the adults who were meant to protect them was not something they ever wanted to do. All eyes will now be on whether British gymnastics can really deliver the change the sport so needs. Natalie Perks, BBC News. Now a look at some other stories making the news today. Police in Brazil say they found what are thought to be the bodies of the missing British journalist Dom Phillips and the indigenous expert Bruno Pereira. Brazilian police have arrested two suspects and say one of them has confessed to burying the bodies, the other suspect has denied any involvement. The Transport Secretary Grant Shapps has warned rail workers who are due to walk out next week that they risk striking themselves out of a job. Around 40,000 are due to go on strike over pay and conditions on Tuesday, Thursday and Saturday. The RMT union said the Transport Secretary's words would make workers more determined to win the dispute. Landlords will be prevented from evicting tenants in England without giving a reason under government plans to overhaul the private rental sector. The government wants to make it illegal for landlords to place blanket bans on renting to benefit claimants or families with children. A British consumer rights campaigner has launched a £750 million legal claim against the technology firm Apple, which could result in payouts for millions of iPhone users in the UK. It follows previous claims which allege the company deliberately slowed down the performance of older phones to drive users to buy newer models. Our technology editor, Zoe Kleiman, is here to explain more. Zoe. This case dates back five years to 2017. It's been bought by Justin Gutman. He says Apple slowed down the performance of some iPhone models by hiring a power management tool in software updates. Apple says the idea was to preserve aging batteries and lengthen the lifespan of older devices. It's a process known as throttling. Mr Gutman's claim has been filed with the Competition Appeal Tribunal. He's seeking damages of £768 million. He says Apple misled users over the incident by pushing them to download software updates that it said would improve the performance of their devices and make them more secure, when in fact it actually slowed them down. The legal claim says Apple did add a mention of the power management tool to its website later on, but says it didn't make it clear it would slow down older iPhones. These models range from the iPhone 6 up to the iPhone X. 
Apple did later allow iPhone users to manually disable the throttling feature. To check whether you have it switched on, go to the battery tab in settings. This claim seeks compensation for everybody affected without them having to opt in. It's thought 25 million British iPhone users could be eligible for a small cash payout if it's successful. Apple settled a similar legal case in the US two years ago, brought by 33 different states. In a statement, Apple said, we have never and would never do anything to intentionally shorten the life of any Apple product or degrade the user experience to drive customer upgrades. Back to you, Sophie. Zoe, thank you. Let's talk about the weather now because it is getting hotter and hotter in much of England and Wales. And temperatures are expected to reach something like 34 Celsius in some parts tomorrow. Heat health alerts have been issued for London, the southeast and the east of England. Our correspondent, Duncan Kennedy, is in Surrey for us tonight. Duncan. Well, Sophie, we've been seeing temperatures here in Surrey today, around about mid-late 20s, 26, 27 degrees. Tomorrow, as you were just saying there, it's expected to hit 30, if not more, across large parts of southern and middle parts of England. Now, France is already seeing 38 degrees, and Spain has touched on 40 degrees, and it's from those areas that we're going to be getting our heat tomorrow. Now, of course, that's going to be uncomfortable, even dangerous for some people, but there are plenty of others who say this is a welcome return to some early summer sunshine. Whether it's heat or water, summer's waves are rolling in across much of the United Kingdom. In the south, temperatures have been heading past the mid-20s, possibly on their way to 30 by tomorrow. Oh yeah, it can be too hot. We've had to come out of London today to try and get some, uh, some air. It's going to be 31 out here yeah. tomorrow. I mean, I'd go in the shed or have a little glass of something to cool down. Might have a dip in the pond soon, but no, it's never hot enough. In Spain, fires have been brought on by temperatures of 40 degrees. The arid soil and vegetation prone to the sun's destructive rays. In Madrid, it's a constant effort to keep cool and hydrated. Every summer it's getting worse and it's affecting us on every level. I find it harder to cope with the heat. It is very hard, but we have to keep going. There is no other way. Across the border, France is also under this punishing heat blanket. 38 degrees makes it enjoyable for many, but others believe it has wider meaning. We're experiencing global warming, so this is inevitable. I think every year it's going to get hotter and hotter. I don't know if there's anything that can be done. In the UK, some regions could see 30 degrees or more tomorrow. Health professionals and others say we must treat it seriously, alongside the fun and relaxation. Duncan Kennedy, BBC News. Well, let's get the full forecast now from Ben Rich. So it's already pretty warm today for some, isn't it? For some, Sophie, not for all, but for some, it has started to turn really very warm indeed. But as we've already heard, there is something even warmer on the way. Let's look at those temperatures today, though, because not everywhere has been in the very warm air. West of London, up to 29.5 degrees. All four nations of the UK have been up above 20 today, but not all have been that close to 30. But let me show you the temperatures across Europe today. 42 in southern Spain, this 40 in the south of France. This is actually a new record. It's the earliest point in the year that France has ever reached 40 degrees. And as we've heard, some of that heat is wafting northwards into the southeast corner, particularly highs tomorrow, 33, maybe 34 degrees. But that heat quite widespread across England and Wales, not so for Northern Ireland or for Scotland, where we already have more cloud bringing rain for some overnight. That rain getting into Scotland through the evening, then pushing down across Northern Ireland through the early hours. England and Wales seeing just the odd shower, some clear spells. And look at these overnight temperatures. This is one change tonight compared with recent nights. Could be quite tricky for sleeping, quite muggy, 13 to 16 degrees. So tomorrow we've got this band of cloud and rain 
working its way southwards and eastwards across Scotland, Northern Ireland, getting into Northern England. This is the dividing line between cooler, fresher and quite windy conditions getting into the north of the UK and those hot conditions that will be wafting into the south of the UK. So 29 for Hull, 29 for Birmingham. East Wales getting close to 30, 33, maybe 34 across parts of the southeast. And with that, the sunshine at this time of year is exceptionally strong. So very high UV levels. That is something to bear in mind if you're out for any length of time. But how long does the heat last? Well, this cold front pushing southeastwards is going to change things for most of us into the weekend. The front just about here, band of cloud bringing some rain, some heavy thundery bursts possibly. Everywhere to the north of that, it will be cooler and fresher. Some showers into western parts of Scotland, but quite a range of temperatures. 16 for Glasgow, just 16 in Birmingham, but 27 in London. Some of that heat is going to try to cling on across the southeast corner, but it won't cling on for long. By Sunday, we're all into cooler, fresher air. There will be some outbreaks of rain around as well, especially in the south, some of that rain heavy and thundery. So it is all change, but the heat is building for now as we head into tomorrow. Back to you, Sophie. And what about uh, next week? Does it last or uh, is that it? Next week looks a bit cooler. We won't be close to 30, but there'll still be some sunshine at times. Ben Rich, thank you very much. And that's it from the BBC News at 6 on Thursday, the 16th of June. You can, of course, keep up to date with all the latest developments on the BBC website from the six team, it is goodbye. Meanwhile, the news continues right here with all our colleagues from the nations and regions across the UK. So it is over to you. Goodbye. <laughs>